Welcome to Guitar Builders Basics, episode 10. <laughs> 10 we have for the 16th of December 2012. I'm an, almost an entire year out. I've written 2012, it is 2013, of course. Uh, crikey. Yes, no comment. This week we discuss removing an old fretboard using resin to stabilize guitar wood. A little bit about tool storage. Uh, people are scared that uh, my tools are going to fall on me or stab an apprentice. Um, justifiably so. Uh, oh, where are we? Helical router cutters and other tools. Uh, reinforcing an old guitar neck, a couple of vintage drills, uh, more accurate. Are there more accurate scale lengths than others? And uh, we've got a couple of videos a video of somebody beating out a saxophone bell and a truly inspirational chap making guitars in the most difficult of circumstances. Uh, finally, a couple, there's also a couple of tips and tricks from you viewers because well, that's the main reason I do this. It's because I'm learning from you. Uh, prick drying nail polish as a filler. There's a some type of nail polish that cures with UV light and, and is very useful supposedly. And finally, sharpening stones, uh, best practice. Uh, so that's that, we've got a lot to do. Uh, news, news, news. Uh, you've seen that we've been incredibly busy doing filming and building the, the kit guitar and filming that for Premier Guitar Magazine. We were doing some work last week, uh, again, a couple of days of, of crazy filming. Uh, playing around with Triton tools, which is phenomenally fun, <laughs> although uh, distracting again. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much over now. For now, I'm back to my usual routine. We're working. I personally am trying to get the Clara Walnut guitar to a state where I can actually put finish on it. No, put strings on it happily. Uh, we're. I'm trying to get the best possible finish I can ever achieve. Uh, and uh, because this guitar deserves it. And that is coming along quite nicely uh, in fits and starts. I've gone back a few steps every now and then, but that's guitar building for you. Uh, I apologize for the noise, for the noise? The noise. I assume you can hear them in the background working away. It's, uh, it's a busy workshop. Uh, everybody else is working away, as you can see, doing other stuff, making tools, getting ready to go away for Christmas. And, uh, yeah, it's got to be done. What else have I written here? Uh, well, I've written advertise yourself. <laughs> Check out the guild, please. Uh, the, the forums and the websites and see what else we have to offer as well as uh, the, the podcast. There are many tutorial videos, go and check them out. And uh, if you decide to become a guild member, you can, but well, you're guaranteed an answer in the podcast, among other things. But uh, yeah, I really, really appreciate your support. Five pounds a month or, or twelve ninety five a month, that sort of a subscription helps keep these podcasts going and, and helps feed my poor family. So, well, go and subscribe. Thank you very much. And uh, there is other news. There are other new tools on the horizon that uh, we're working on but those are those are in progress and uh, i'm not going to tell you about them now all right on to the meat of the podcast your questions which i'll try and answer uh, remember if i get an answer wrong or you think you have a better way of doing things let me know because I'm set in my ways to a certain extent. I've been doing this for a while and uh, I do what I do. I sometimes, you know, shake things up a little bit and try something new. Uh, but I often don't even think about trying things a different way until somebody suggests it. So if you have any ideas, if you've found a different way of building a guitar, and there are many, let me know. And uh, you'll be included in the podcast and the tips and tricks, and uh, or I might just steal your idea and make a video about it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, talking about that actually, uh, guild memberships. For the guild members, there is a new video series going up, making the 
well, there's actually several new video series that are going to be edited over the next couple of weeks and start going up. And it's the making of this workbench, which isn't finished, but the, the video was halfway there. And uh, the making of that kit guitar. Those are private videos, but uh, if you're a Guild member, those are going to be appearing soon. All right, questions, your questions, your questions. Uh, this is from CJC Designs on the forum. He says, hey, good people, I'm wanting to remove a fretboard uh, that looks like it's split. How would I go about removing an old fretboard? And, uh, well, funnily enough, that is the very, very first thing, apart from changing strings, that I ever did on a guitar. And uh, I was ill-advised enough to try it on a 1930s Gibson uh, 00 acoustic that I had. Uh, probably didn't need to have the fretboard removed on reflection. But, hey, what can you do? Now, uh, in the forums, other people have suggested that uh, you can use an iron, i.e. just a regular old clothes iron, put it on the frets and gently heat everything up and the glue will slowly melt and separate. And unless the luthier or guitar company have been mean enough to use a polyurethane glue that just doesn't separate under heat. That is a very, very good way and a very cheap way of doing it relatively easily. I, in fact, I would probably suggest that for most hobby guitar builders, try that first. You might, might possibly run into these pitfalls. If your frets have been glued in using only glue, and clamped, like some people think is the best way to, to install frets, I don't, by the way, uh, then doing that will delaminate effectively your frets and all your frets will fall out. And um, this is not good. Uh, however, to be honest, most guitar companies do not glue in frets like that. Most guitar companies use a pressure technique, i.e. a hammer or a clamp that pushes it into a slot that's too small and uh, a compression fretting method of some sort. We do a compression fretting method mixed with glue and the glue effectively fills the gap and adds a little bit more stability but uh, the fretboard itself holds the frets in. So yes, with most of our necks, if you need to take the fretboard off ever, uh, then the frets won't, won't fall out if you heat it up. I have, remember I'm not a repairman, uh, I know a bit about repairing guitars by dint of making the things, but uh, I don't have a repairman's mind. I, I don't like, I don't enjoy going and trying to fix somebody else's problem. It, it goes back to my training as a violin maker. Everybody wanted me to make a 400 year old violin copy and, you know, down to the tenth of a millimetre, I'm, I'm just not interested in that. And the repairs are the same thing, uh, apart from standard fret shops and things. To go into an acoustic and, and fiddle around for two days trying to fix a broken, um, well, a crack in the top, for example, um, or a brace or something, it's, it doesn't appeal. So I haven't taken that many fretboards off. I have used heat, i.e. I've, I've warmed up the fretboard like that with an iron. Or, uh, or a lump of steel that was warmed up and then just put on it because I didn't have an iron that day. And uh, I have heated up knives or paint scraper type things and put them underneath and slowly wedged it that way. The problem with that is if you get the grain the wrong way you can rip the hell out of everything and just <laughs> ruin your guitar basically. Uh, so. Yeah, this is one of those days when I try and very rarely will I say don't use a blade. And this is one of those situations. Uh, just use heat, not a blade. I have seen people use steam. And uh, that's the same thing for an acoustic net, neck. If you want to do a neck reset, people pipe steam into the joint. And uh, that's possible, but uh, again, fiddly and difficult. And frankly, 
yeah, it's fiddly and difficult. So I don't know if that helps in the slightest because, well, I'm no expert. Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, so yes, good luck, CJ. Good luck, CJC Designs. Go and steal your wife's iron. All right, from from unpronounceable name on the forums, S three K five hundred eight. Um, I'm very interested in the etymology of that name. He says, hmm. Now this may sound like a tangent worthy of the podcast. It is worthy. I'm reading it. But please bear with me as I want to explain why this possibly awful idea has occurred to me. My father makes pens. He has a lathe and everything. It scares me a little. Needless to say, in order to make some of the woods, generally highly figured character grade, more durable and hard wearing, as well as adding distinctive colours and effects to otherwise bland woods, he uses a resin, I presume epoxy. This provides his work with a very, very nice finish, and as I said, some distinctive colours and patterns. Uh, this has got me to thinking, through my limited experience and knowledge, it seems that generally dense woods make better, I imagine highly subjective, as with most things, uh, in parenthesis, fretboards. While plain black can be sexy, I do find ebony to be a bit bland. So combining the method above, with some highly figured or paints stroke dyes, would it be possible to create an effective fretboard using resin? And if so, would it, what would the possible benefits be, if any? Or are there any better ways of achieving this goal? Mr. S3K508, you, sir, are a genius because you think exactly like I do. And, uh, and I love you. Yes. Uh, a lot of turners obviously will impregnate their woods with, uh, with an epoxy uh, or a resin like that. And uh, it's, it's very, very cool. It's a very good way of, uh, well, as you say, strengthening the wood and making it more durable and, and easier to work. I've also heard of a tool company in America whose name completely escapes me. And uh, they make wooden planes. And they do the same thing. They impregnate the wood with this epoxy and that makes their wooden block planes and well, I suppose they make more than just block planes, but it makes their wooden planes much more durable and longer lasting than others. And it's something that I've played with. Uh, it's a thought that I've played with playing with. I think that works. On and off for the last uh, six months or so. Now, uh, using resin for as a fretboard is not new in the slightest. It's like people think that carbon fibre is a new technology. It's been around and in use constantly for oh, easily 25 years now, I would say. And, uh, well, one of the things about carbon fibre is... Well, carbon fibre is only half of the equation. The other half is resin. So, so yes. Uh, there are carbon fiber fretboards, there are carbon fiber necks, and they are half carbon fiber, half resin, so it's being used in that, in that world already. There are also other companies that use a resin fretboard. I'm pretty sure that Steinberger, I should have done my research beforehand and I apologize for not. Steinberger used to at least uh, have fretboards that were made entirely of, of a resin. And the frets were the frets were glued directly into the resin in the in the mold, and uh, it was an integral thing and very nice. In fact, I think the entire neck might have been just solid resin with some dye in it. Uh, yes, so it's not a bad idea. Where it does become interesting is using non-standard woods and strengthening non-standard woods. So we could have something like cedar. Western red cedar, which is really soft, but very pretty. And if you impregnate it with a resin, you could suddenly have a completely non-standard and very pretty, very cool fretboard. And, uh, and it's very interesting. I suspect that the process, the best way to impregnate it with resin is in a vacuum. So fill the, you know, put it in a bag, fill it all with wood and resin and uh, suck, basically. And uh, there we go. So it's something that I've, I would like to do. 
if I had any spare time whatsoever, ever. Um, yeah, so no, uh, very, very good idea, sir. And uh, yeah, good on you. Thank you very much for, uh, for suggesting it. All right. Ooh, vintage drills. There, there is somebody on YouTube um, who I, I should have written his name down. I mentioned in a comment that I like old drills and uh, he likes old drills too. So uh, let, let's go and find some old drills and uh, I'll show you my old drills. I've only got two, but hey. And here we have them. Uh, not many people know that uh, Black & Decker, I want to say invented, they made the first hand drills for the domestic market and uh, they are they're lovely uh, just can you just it's just beautiful and i picked these up for a couple of quid at a you know car boot sales and things or probably 10 or 20 pounds on ebay it's got a you know a model 6141 chuck by a Jacobs Chuck from Sheffield in England. And uh, yeah, it's an absolute beautiful, beautiful little tool. Uh, lock in there. It's, it's obviously not particularly safe to use and the motor smells a bit, but, <clears throat> but it works and, uh, and I do use it. This, this beast, this is a wolf. And I found this at a, uh, well, somebody was throwing it out to be recycled for the for the metal, and uh, again, uh, well, it's the thing with these things. They've got metal bodies, and if something goes wrong, you're going to get electrocuted a little bit. Uh, so make sure that you use it in a house or a building that has the proper safety uh, here. Uh, so, like my workshop is very good. The thing is, this has only got a 550 RPM, whereas this beauty is, oh come on, it did say it somewhere, I can't read, where did it say what the RPM was on this, I don't know, anyway, this goes much faster than that does, and uh, it's lovely, so, so that's it, I, I buy them, I mean it looks like a ray gun kind of thing, in fact, that's what I bought this for. I thought I'd paint it up and uh, turn it into a ray gun, but I put a new lead on it and it works fine. So, old drills, old tools, just sexy and lovely and wonderful and, uh, uh, and worth having. So, uh, on with the show, on with the show. While I'm on the move, I'm going to talk about tool storage. Now, you've seen my, well, you've seen my chisels and planes behind me, and uh, people are worried that these are a bit dangerous. And they kind of are, but especially this back row, you know, they angle back, they're near there, and not really, well, they're not likely, they're not likely to fall off. These are a little bit more worrying where they, where they stick out in the second tier. And if you're not careful, you can hurt yourself. So, yeah, you've got to be careful. And uh, at some point I'm gonna do a video Oh, look at how dusty those are. Crikey. We've been making templates. Uh, I'm going to do a, a video. This is our purfling uh, chisels that we're going to be producing soon. I'm going to do a video just on tool storage. Now, you might have noticed that I like using magnets. And, uh, yeah, they really are useful. Now, the biggest issue that people had, or seem to have, is that my planes are on these lovely shelves. And, uh, well, they are. What they don't know is they have magnets under there. Yes, if there weren't any magnets holding it down, uh, there is the possibility that the, uh, just the vibration of everyday workshop use would uh, knock them down and cause trouble uh, but yeah the magnets there stop that from happening and uh, yeah i'm more worried 
by these ones on the top. And uh, I do look at them every now and then. Oh, too much dust. And make sure they're not falling down. So, uh, yeah, more magnets, more rack, more tools. You can't have too many tools. Oh, speaking of tools, there we go. Remember, I mentioned that I just have fallen in love with bench cookies by Bench Dog Tools. I'm selling them in my shop now. Well, soon. <laughs> I need to put them up there. But uh, yeah, no, I fell in, I've fallen in love with these things and I've decided that I wanted to become a distributor because they're damn useful. So, uh, yeah, just a quick overview of how I store my tools. These are fun. Well, two holes. That was difficult to line that up. Looking through a screen, crikey. So, um, so there we go. On with some questions. All right, that was, that was a digression, it was. Uh, so, yes, uh, <clears throat> that was in answer to David Coates. He wrote, uh, Hi Ben, I've been watching with keen interest your podcast and the new workshop looks fantastic. And it's great to hear of apprentices being taken on to learn skills. Uh, so overall, what a great job you're doing. However, from one craftsman to another, please make a better rack for storing your chisels and gouges. I get shivers every time I watch you deliver your podcast and all those sharp tools with their edges pointing skywards and heavy planes above them. It's only a matter of time before you or some other unfortunate soul cuts or impales their hands on them. Please turn them round. Uh, yes. There we go. I think that it is entirely possible. I, I could put them down that way with the, with the edges down, but 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 I like it. Uh, yeah, like I said just now, I, th I think because of the angle that they're at, the the pointy bits. What's the technical term? The sharp edge. The cutting edge, it really is a cutting edge. The cutting edge is, for most of them, actually up against the wood that's behind them. And uh, it's relatively safe. The, the lower down ones with the bigger chisels, I think actually you've got a good point. And uh, it's not particularly safe. <clears throat> the planes aren't gonna fall down. They've got magnets holding them up. And uh, I should move the ones that are on the top really. So, uh, thank you for worrying, frankly. Um, yes, I've got even more to think about now. Uh, Cracking. <laughs> I don't want to be sued by somebody if they come in and borrow a chisel. They're just not allowed to borrow my chisels, damn it. All right, let us move on, let us move on. I've still got a frog in my throat from all the dust in there. We've been, we've been making um, Les Paul and Strat type templates for the shop. Uh, we. Howard has been making templates for the shop and the dust is just horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. Uh, okay, from Javen248 on YouTube. I'm sure I've answered some of your questions before. Uh, you must be good at making good questions. Uh, he says, having built three burnable prototypes, I've run directly into your talk about the neck difficulty, uh, yet I find most videos spend their time on body build. It made me realize why necks carry headstock shape and logo brands. Mark the hardest part to make. True. Uh, what are your thoughts on fret placement? I should have thought ahead and turned that page sooner. Uh, what are your thoughts on fret placement, calculations, tables, etc.? Which ones are more right than others? Uh, what are your benchmark manufacturers? I've heard PRS SEEG the Korean made, and Ibanez Korean built instruments are done right. Again, in, in quotation marks. Others, question mark? Uh, fret placement is done with a mathematical calculation. Uh, if you follow the calculation and cut them accurately, then it is done right. And frankly, any big manufacturer uh, well, if, if they don't use the right calculation, then they won't be a big manufacturer for long, pretty much. 
So, no, I, I think it is, it is an utter fallacy that there are some instruments that have got better frets than others. There are instruments that might come from the factory better set up, uh, with regards to intonation and uh, saddle positions and things like that, or, uh, or with regard to well, the setup, how high the strings are and how well it plays and all that. But a fret position is an absolute, and it's based on it's based on a, um, a calculation which I can't recall because I'm not mathematically minded. So, yes, there are various fret calculators online. I really want somebody to make one for, for my website, actually. Uh, that kind of coding is beyond me. And again, as long as it's coded correctly, then uh, you know, use it. Your problem is more likely to be being able to accurately put the slot in the right place. You're talking, you know, to within one hundredth of a millimeter is where the, the the calculators tend to put you. They say put this at four five point three three six millimeters, and uh, I can't see that fine. But uh, when I'm doing it by hand, check out the videos I've done. I've made several videos showing how to uh, mark out frets and position frets and, and all of that. And they're at the guild, crimsonguitars.com forward slash guild. And uh, all the videos are down in the right hand menu. And, uh, and they're of course on YouTube as well, um, if you feel like <laughs> trying to navigate within YouTube. Uh, so that's that. Frankly, Frankly, for, for a beginner, I would suggest buying a pre-cut fretboard. It's, well, as you say, it, it is the most difficult bit to get right. And uh, I sell fretboards, many, many other people sell fretboards with, with the slots pre-cut to the right, right dimensions, or right positions at least. And uh, it saves you a lot of heartache and grief and well, having to burn guitars. My very, very first guitar, I've still got it. Uh, the, the calculator, it was a sheet that I had in uh, Martin Cox's book. Yeah. Oh, crikey. I still, I still use this one. Uh, so I think you can see where I've very carefully penciled out the numbers down the side of the... Uh, um, Spreadsheet, because I misread, and somewhere along the lines, uh, I got confused by the numbers of the cells and the numbers of the frets, and I ended up with a 14 or a 15 fret instrument with a strange, strange scale, uh, and read carefully, be careful. But uh, yeah, I mean this this says you know three five point six four. 79.28 and uh, if you've got a good ruler and a sharp pencil and you're accurate it's perfectly possible to to make a good fretboard using that as the basis uh, alternatively buy a jig for a table saw or something if you're in production or one of the tools that we are uh, I have seriously planned and designed in my head over many years is a good, a very, very good fret slotting mitre jig. And uh, yes, that is something that we really need to make at Crimson Guitars. I'm just waiting for a few more staff. Uh, but that's going to be, that is going to be, uh, the saw will be held in place with magnets and free to move because we're using Teflon tape or possibly ball bearings. And it's gonna come Instead of with a pin uh, method of marking where your template is, um, it's going to have some spring steel that goes in a slot, which fits in a slot. So you can buy a pre-made fretboard and that will be your template. And we're going to supply it with uh, four or five different templates and, and that's planned. If you're interested in one, let me know. If I can say to my accountant, hey, we've got four people who want one. Um, Maybe maybe I can afford to employ somebody else. Uh, that that was a digression worthy of the podcast. Okay. 
from WM Rolder on YouTube, commenting on one of our sharpening videos. Uh, he says, my concern with any stone is, does it remain flat? Is there any problem with uneven wear on the cutting surface? Uh, in, in the sharpening video, in fact, in that one, I was very um, derogatory about any other sharpening method, and I've grown up a little bit since then. And I'm going to be doing another video showing several other sharpening techniques very soon. Uh, so in the video I was using water stones and saying that anything other than a water stone is sacrilegious and pointless and a waste of time and uh, um, you're a plebeian if you consider using anything else. And uh, while I still believe that water stones are the best, uh, my eyes are open and I'm prepared to consider other things. Anyhow, he says, uh, do they stay flat? Uh, is there a problem with uneven wear? Or does the way you use it to sharpen tend to keep the surface dressed? Or do you actually do dressing to the stone? I once saw an episode of the Woodwright's shop on American PBS where they made their own stones. Crikey. Um, and dressed them against each other or something like. Or finally, are these entirely hard enough that wear is negligible? I love that word. Love your stuff. Thank you. I love yours. Okay, um, yes, hi. Yes, there is a problem with uneven wear. Yes, you have to dress the stones yourself uh, and regularly. There are people, I have heard people say that the, they, the way they sharpen uses the whole stone. Uh, that, was, that was me imagining myself as a plain blade uh, using the whole bit of stone. Um, dancer I am not. Uh, and that minimizes that, but frankly, it, it's, it's a load of tosh, frankly. You, you will need to dress a stone and you will need to dress it regularly. I, I don't. I don't dress them every single time I use them, but I should. Uh, they go out of flat very, very, very rapidly, but uh, yeah, uh, but it's, they're also easy because they go out of flat so rapidly. They're also very, very easy to flatten uh, because they're so soft. And water stones really are the best um, stones to buy. Very briefly, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say in the, in the sharpening video. You can go and buy yourself a Triton sharpening uh, whetstone sharpener with a big wheel and, and a water trough and a grinder and polishing polishing. Uh, felt, leather, <sighs> wheels to, to polish with uh, paste. I can't talk anymore. <sighs> and, and those are very good, although you end up with a curve instead of a flat because you're polishing, you're, you're carving away metal on a big round stone. There are people who use a scary sharp system where you've got a plate of, uh, well, plate glass or uh, I've got a huge granite stone and they go and they spend tens of dollars on fine grades of, of paper and they use the paper to sharpen their blade, which, well, every single time you do that, you're going to end up throwing away one or two dollars or pounds worth of very expensive two and a half thousand grit sandpaper or wet and dry paper. Whereas you can go and buy a water stone for 20 quid or 30 quid. I haven't bought one for a while. Uh, and despite the fact that you have to spend maybe a minute each time you use it, just making sure it's flat with another stone or a, a diamond lapping plate or actually the granite stone with some sandpaper. Or if you're very naughty like me, you can put it through a belt sander before you... I've got a big drum sander and uh, I put my stones through that when I was, but just before I was due to change the paper. Um, that was naughty. But uh, yeah, you can spend 30 quid on the stone and it will last you for many, 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 many years. And uh, well, actually take you less time. So I don't like the scary sharp system, it's expensive. It works, it certainly works, but it's expensive. Uh, don't like oil stones, they're slow and hard and nasty and difficult and dirty. Um, I have oil stones, I just don't use them anymore. And uh, 
yeah, so go and buy some water stones and uh, just look after them, basically. Okay, 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 okay. Um, some tips and tricks. This from Big Oak. Uh, as a note to Ben and any others who may care on router bits, oh, I love this one. Uh, seeing as Ben has found the wonders of more than two flutes, I recently did a video on Radian, Radian router bits. And uh, I'll pick this up, being careful not to cut myself. And Radian cutters have got, uh, I don't know if you can see it, they've got four blades. And mind blowing, mind blowing, just clean cut and it's just a sexy router bit to use. I, I did not think that router bits could be sexy. These are sexy. So anyway, I've done the review, check the video out, and I show, I use one of them in anger and show it against a two flute cutter. And uh, yes, it was that. In fact, I've got three of them and two of them are in routers as I speak. Um, I've got lots of routers as well. Uh, okay, so yeah, four flute cutters are amazing. He says, Seeing as Ben has found the wonders of more than two flutes and router bits, being a machinist equivalent of an end mill in many respects, you may even be more astounded by a helical cutting tool. Helical? Helical? Helical. I'll choose helical. <sighs> Say that fast. Uh, for those who don't know or, or are uninformed, <laughs> a tip. Oh. I need to stop riffing on the word helical and start reading again. For those who don't know, a helical cutting tool has blades that spiral around the diameter, thus giving a longer cutting edge and typically a smoother cutting angle. To make a simple comparison, imagine edge planing a, well he says one eighth of an inch board. What is one eighth of an inch? Six millimeters. Uh, imagine planing a six or three millimeters. Six millimeters, three millimeters. I don't know. Three millimeter board. Let's go for a three millimeter board or one eighth of an inch if, uh, if you um, choose. Uh, first, you have a two inch wide 50 mil uh, plane and you try cutting with the cutting edge at 90 degrees to the length of the board. It's kind of hard and usually causes tear out or skipping of the blade. Now imagine that you have the same board but you have a plane with a four inch blade that way. Uh, and you can angle across the board while still pushing it in line with the length of the board. It's a bit easier and smoother and doesn't skip as easily. Uh, the narrow plane would compare to a straight cut bit and the angle would compare to the helical. Uh, now that might not be the best example but it gets the gist across. Also carbide is amazing. Uh, yes, carbide is amazing. Uh, although it tends to heat up, I've been told. I haven't played with it. Um, I've, I've been told that you have to, have to, have to, have to use, um, when you're cutting metal at least, coolant, because uh, I'm sort of a, a hobby engineer as well, I suppose. Uh, but I've not, I have not experienced a carbide router, carbide router cutter, although I would like to, um, because I'm a tool junkie, frankly. Uh, helical cutters, yes, exactly that, basically, well, like you said, if you're cutting a bit of wood that wide and your blade is that wide, as it goes, it takes one huge chunk. If your blade is much wider at an angle, you're only taking a small bit off on each side of, of the blade. I've seen and heard about, although not played with, uh, mechanical um, planar thicknesses where they've got the big drum that the blade that the teeth go into and instead of one long 12 inch wide cutter they've got lots of tiny 10 millimeter or, or centimeter long cutters and those are in um, helically um, they spiral around the thing and apparently they do not get blunt they last four or five or six times longer than a, a traditional flat blade and uh, 
I think with the ones I'm actually thinking about, you just pull it out and flip it around and put the tooth back in the other way and you, you sort it. So, so I am in lust with the idea of uh, helical cutters for my planar thicknesser. And uh, I had no idea that anybody made them for a router. In fact, I still don't. Um, if, if anybody can find a supplier for helical router cutters, I will give them a call and see if maybe we can do a review at some point and uh, show you and we'll see. Um, if they are better than four flute cutters from Radian tools, then uh, well, I'll be surprised. I'll be surprised, pleasantly surprised, because uh, the Radian tools are phenomenal. So there we go. Um, that's a, an awesome tip. Uh, I'm going to go and uh, I'm going to go and do some more research. Once again, I'm so busy that I only pulled this uh, this script together uh, ooh, an hour ago, and I've been filming for 45 minutes now or so. So uh, yes, I've done less research than I should have done, but uh, still, still. We're coming together. Okay, um, Big Oak has also sent us a video, and uh, as he's a metal worker, uh, predominantly, uh, it's a very interesting video watching a chap make the bell of a saxophone, and uh, you know he sits there in his metal workshop, banging away, banging away, banging away, and uh, he's he's attached that video. Hello, because. Uh, I was talking about the copper talk. I love the way that shines. I sound like the the, the, the car from bloody cars. <laughs> okay, maybe I think I, I think I should probably go and have some lunch now. Okay. Anyway, it's a very cool video. The guy bangs out the saxophone, uh, the bell of the saxophone, and it's it's a good watch. The video is in the show notes, which is at crimsonguitars.com forward slash workshop diary and the links are in the menu to the right and and a very cool tip from black shard on youtube he says got a tip for you uh, when you get to a point that you need to fill some bigger hole it often happens uh, and you need a huge amount of fast drying transparent material to fill it uh, a dent in the final stages of a build or something like that. God forbid. Um, I've tried something unusual and it works pretty good. Actually, my girlfriend got me to do this. Uh, she uses that Chinese nail polish that reacts to UV light. Uh, the stuff is awesome because it, until it gets under UV light, it stays liquid like glue gel or gel glue um, or vice versa. Uh, however, after 30 seconds under UV light, it becomes unbelievably hard, transparent plastic. Uh, so you have as much time as you want for applying it, or open time, and when you're satisfied with the application, you just shine on it. Uh, you, of course, need a UV light, but that's not such a big deal nowadays. Uh, best regards, love your work. Winky face. Um, a, face <laughs> a face that is winking. Crikey. All right. Um, shit, I think I'm blushing. Yes. Calm down, Ben. Uh, I, I would like to play with that nail varnish. I'm going to go and buy some. Uh, I, I would really like to play with UV curing finishes as well. I've heard, I've heard great things about UV cured finish and, and some not so great things. Uh, from the same chap. Uh, Patrick Egel, uh, now, he used to make electric guitars, sold the company, started building jazzers, and now is pretty much the best acoustic guitar maker in the UK, uh, at least at that sort of huge level. <sighs> yes, so anyway, Patrick Egel used to use UV Cure, and uh, he used a lot, and he back then a couple of years ago told me it was amazing wonderful cool excellent really quick ultra thin sounds great and um, and when i spoke to him a couple of months ago uh, he was saying oh i've got a uv cure booth to sell because i don't like it anymore and i think he's gone back to using nitro so um yes we'll see <laughs> um so i'd like to play with that 
Um, and uh, and yes, I'm definitely going to go and buy some uh, some of the UV Cure nail varnish because if nothing else, it sounds like a very useful thing to have around the place, mainly for repairs. I, I would never hopefully dent a guitar that we've just finished building. Um, not again. And uh, yeah, but it sounds useful. Finally, some more inspiration. I've I've convinced myself, or more importantly, I've convinced my wife, that I cannot survive without a 2200 square foot workshop, or bigger, filled to the gunnels with tools and toys and, and wood and lovely things and apprentices, um, as long as they're quiet while I'm filming videos. And, uh, well, you've got to check out this video. The link is in um, the usual places in the description of the video and at the show notes. But it's a chap who is literally making custom guitars in, uh, you know, in a refugee camp in Malawi. It is, it's amazing. He doesn't have very many tools. He doesn't have anything that I would consider absolutely essential to make guitars. And by gum, by gum, I just said by gum. <coughs> He's making them by gum. So, <laughs> So go and check out the video. It really is very, very cool and, uh, and well worth a watch. So uh, yeah, thanks to forum member Victor Hauer for uh, putting the link in our forums. And uh, yes. So once again, thank you for watching. Um, please, please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hey, news. Right at the end of the show, we've just gone over the 15,000 subscriber mark, which is actually quite phenomenal. Um, and yeah, we're, I suppose the next milestone is 2 million video views or something. But anyway, uh, yeah, please subscribe to the videos. And uh, if you feel like supporting us monetarily, which I quite frankly uh, really, really appreciate, join the guild as a paying member uh, because, well, you get perks. Uh, you get 5% off in the shop or 10% off depending on your level. And uh, you're guaranteed an answer in the videos and I'll obviously answer you on the forum whether you're a free member or not, but uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. Check out the shop, check out crimsonguitars.com and follow our Facebook and Twitter feeds during the week. But more importantly, well, have a good week. See you next week. Cheers. Bye, gum. <laughs>